Hello. Today I will be talking to you about symbiotic forms and the lichenized phenotype. A bit about me. My name is Clara Scharnagel, and I am currently the Tucker Curator of Lichenology at the University in Jepson Herbaria. Today I am speaking to you from the University of California Berkeley campus, which sits upon the territory of Hui Chin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chechenyo speaking Ohlone people. Before I launch into my talk, I want to take a minute to acknowledge where we are. This has been quite an intense and bizarre year for the entire world. And for many of us, the impacts of this global pandemic are far from over. There is, to my mind, a silver lining of everything that we've been through, and that is conferences like these. These virtual platforms have enabled people from all over the world and even from all levels of academia and research to join these conferences who otherwise might not have been able to. And of course, look at this right here. When else are we able to have a session that actually bridges two different uh, conferences? And so this is really a tremendous experience to be able to share this with you. And I want to give a really big shout out of thanks to the organizers of both conferences to the organizers of this session in particular, to my fellow speakers, and of course to you, the attendees, who are likely tuning into this at many different times of the day, from the wee hours of the morning to the midday to late into the night. So thank you for joining me. Here's a brief outline of my talk for today. In considering symbiotic forms and the lichenized phenotype, I will begin by exploring interkingdom interactions through the lens, of course, of lichens. I'll then go deeper into discussing what I mean by the lichenized phenotype, and finally discuss the ways that we have been approaching studying the lichen symbiosis in terms of both the strengths and the weaknesses. So exploring interkingdom interactions. I'm going to do this by using a backyard case study of the green shield lichen, Flavoparmelia caparata. And I literally mean my own backyard. But I wanna start with this image, uh, which is uh, an homage to Lynn Margulies. And this is because she, in Microcosmos and other works of hers, put forth this idea that everything we look at around us, every living thing, it, that we perceive as an individual is actually a complex microbial consortium. And today we would likely refer to that concept as a holobiont. And I'm prefacing this section and in, indeed my entire talk with this idea because lichens are a wonderful case study to examine this idea, this concept of a holobiont. Where does an individual begin and end? So here we have what we would consider to be a lichen individual. The, the round structure that you see is the thallus, which is the growth that you see of the lichen. And this is Flavoparmelia caparata or the common green shield lichen, which is growing on an apple tree in my own backyard. And I wanted to start at the this sort of broadest idea of interkingdom interactions, which is the lichen and its substrate. Lichens can grow on many different kinds of substrates, including what we might consider to be inanimate substrates like rock and soil. But of course we know that those host their own microbiomes as well, as well as other materials, including man-made materials such as brick and metal and plastic. But this, Lichens that grow epiphytically um, on the bark of trees, and there are, are even some lichen species that grow on the leaves of trees, have um, a living substrate. And this living substrate, this tree, for example, has its own host of interkingdom interactions, its own microbiome, its own mycorrhizal associations, its own herbivores and pollinators and frugivores to, to be interacting with. And then it has these lichens, which are simply growing on it as a substrate. 
considering this interkingdom interaction of the lichen growing on this living substrate, which is the tree, there is actually surprisingly small amount of overlap between the endophytic communities within the tree, and that's in terms of fungi and bacteria, and the endolichenic communities within the lichen. The substrates that lichens grow on, how they grow on those substrates, and where they grow on those substrates, as seen in the images on this slide, are largely determined by microclimatic conditions. So what I'm showing here, which is the plum tree right next to the apple tree in my backyard, we have quite thick growth of our green shield lichen, but only on certain aspects of these branches. So on the trunk, it's only uh, in a certain direction and on the branches, it's only on the top. And so this edge, what determines this edge? I consider to be the lichen line. And again, this can be at this lichen to substrate scale or it can be at a landscape scale. And the lichen line is basically an indicator of a change in microclimatic conditions. In my own dissertation work, I have demonstrated that even along very large environmental gradients, such as the latitudinal diversity gradient, lichen diversity in terms of both species richness and functional diversity is influenced by a combination of global macroclimatic patterns, as well as much more local scale microclimatic patterns. And again, that is an interaction with the substrate as well. Let's think about some other interkingdom interactions that this backyard case study lichen is going through. One of these is interactions with animals. So in the one image, I have uh, actually a, a few lichens pictured, but you see this droplet of water suspended on the surface of Flavo parmelia caparata. Many lichens, including this one, have at least partial hydrophobicity on their surface, and this allows water to bead up on their surface. And so not only here in the fairly dry climate of California, but also in much more extreme cases like the Atacama Desert, lichens actually serve as a water capture place that animals then come to collect moisture from them. So it's a very important function. And lichens in general, even though each individual lichen is quite small, they can cover quite a bit of surface and they do play an important role in water balance in different ecosystems. Another quite different role uh, for lichens in interactions with animals is pictured on the right slide or on the right picture of this slide, which is use as nesting material. This is a hummingbird nest, but the use of lichens for nesting material is not exclusive to hummingbirds. And there could be a variety of reasons for this use, including of course, camouflaging the nest, but also many lichens contain quite a um, diversity of secondary metabolites, many of which have antimicrobial properties, and it could actually be protecting the eggs and the nestlings from potential pathogens. An intra-kingdom interaction is considering interactions between lichens and other fungi. On the right in this picture, you can see a lichen overgrowing a polypore that's growing out of the side of the plum tree. And this is likely not a direct interaction. It's more like the interaction between the lichen and the tree itself, whereas where it's just growing over the polypore as a substrate. Um, but of course, I cannot say for certain whether it's whether there aren't um, smaller interactions taking place. On the left, I have circled some black dots on the thallus of one of our green shield lichens. And those that is evidence of a lichenicolous fungus. So lichenicolous fungi are fungi that grow within or on the lichen thallus but do not seem to be directly involved in the symbiotic interaction of the lichen. And they can play a variety of roles, including simply 
commensals, just using the lichen itself as a habitat or a substrate, to of course being quite um, pathogenic. And even within the pathogenic uh, lichenicolous fungi, they can range from attacking the algal partner to attacking the fungal partner to attacking both. And then of course there are interactions between lichens and other lichens. And again, this is all just stuff that I'm observing right on the tree in my backyard. So I have circled um, to the eye unfamiliar with lichens. You may not have noticed these right away, but there are other lichens growing in and amongst our quite abundant Flavoparmelia caparita. And we, a lot of these interactions are, again, either commensal or, of course, competitive in terms of competing for space. And a lot of that comes down to just growth rate. Um, of course, the sort of bushy tufted one uh, on the left has the advantage of rising above the substrate. Um, and there could be some other kinds of interactions, including chemical interactions as well. And this is seen more in crustose lichens, which I will get to in a bit. So there are definitely interkingdom interactions going on at all levels of this Flavoparmelia caparita in my backyard. And these not only interact, of course, with other lichens growing on the substrate, but also with other, other epiphytes. And very commonly, this would be uh, moss, liverworts, and other, other bryophytes. And I, I like to include this because of course, uh, many folks that I interact with uh, when telling them about lichens, they can easily confuse lichens and mosses because they do often grow in the same places, but they are not the same. <laughs> they are definitely an example of an inter-kingdom interaction. And in, they do compete for space. And in this image, you can see the lichen overgrowing the moss, but just as frequently you can see it the other way around. So that's a bit of a broad overview in thinking about these interkingdom interactions from the perspective of a lichen in my own backyard. So let's think a bit more about the lichenized phenotype. The lichenized phenotype is beautiful and has fascinated us for quite some time as evidenced in this beautiful print by Ernst Haeckel. And I will go through some images on the following slides just to show the tremendous diversity of these lichenized forms. So Heckel really captured quite a few brilliantly beautiful ones, but we have um, crusts that are really close to the substrate, but can nevertheless be quite colorful as this one here and this one here, which almost is actually called the map lichen. It looks like a map. And then of course we have our beautiful, much more, um, starting to get much more three-dimensional folios growth forms. Uh, and then these growth forms that seem to be some sort of mix of the two. Then we have these squamulose ones. And of course the fruiting bodies on these have quite a diversity of forms as well to these much more what we call fruticose or highly branched or bushy uh, growth forms which can of course take a variety of forms in and of themselves. And then here is our Flavoparmelia caparata, which is, would be considered a folios lichen. This is just a small subsampling of the potential diversity of lichenized phenotypes that are out there. But there is nevertheless within that huge diversity of color and shapes and sizes, some commonalities and Rosemary Honiger in her 1993 Tansley review did a beautiful job of illustrating this, literally illustrating this, um, but also describing it. So there are some common features when we actually look at cross sections through these lichen growth forms um, that no matter what kind of lichen you're looking at, they have some representation of this. So the sort of thick uh, gray that you see would be the cortex or outer layer. Then where the black dots are, that would be the algal layer or the photobiont layer. Um, and then the little dashes with a lot of white space around them would be the medullary layer. Um, and you can see that there's quite a 
diversity of potential arrangements of these layers in the example shown here, but nevertheless, we see these layers consistently. And again, coming back to our folio species, the, here's a more detailed um, image of what I'm talking about. So we have this upper cortex and then this algal zone, and then um, which the al algae are placed within the lichen thallus to really optimize conditions for photosynthesis. Then our medullary layer, which is where a lot of osmotic balance and gas exchange takes place. And then for many growth forms, but particularly for our foliose ones, we have this lower cortex as well. And then here's a, a light microscope um, cross-section of the same thing. Really fascinating is this idea, or putting side by side, this image of the cross-section of the lichen on the left, and then this is a cross-section through a leaf. And so these folios lichens, for example, have really come to the same optimization for photosynthesis that the organization within a plant leaf has. Um, and this is an idea extolled by Peter Crittenden and others. And it's not just parallels between um, folios lichens and leaf structure, but also certain um, fruticose lichens and tree structures, et cetera. And so there's um, some really interesting stuff to explore there. I'm, I'm including this slide not to give you a full lecture on lichen biology, <laughs> but rather to say just how far this lichenized phenotype extends. It can extend even to the propagules of the lichens. So many, many people ask me, how do lichens reproduce? And of course it depends on the species. Sometimes the fungus will just send out spores on its own, which, happen, which have to happen to land and germinate somewhere where they can find a compatible partner. But others like our very own Flavopermelia caparata can send off these small um, structures called ceridia, which are little bundles of fungal hyphae and algae. And so they are set to go to start a new lichen wherever they land. So wow, there is a lot going on in terms of this lichenized phenotype. And we really want to understand how, how these inter-kingdom interactions can come together to create this lichenized phenotype. And furthermore, how with such a tremendous diversity of lichenized phenotypes, do we nevertheless see these commonalities of structural components? So I'm going to go into a laboratory case study now of the sunburst lichens in Thoria parientina. And I wanna start this section with this quote by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is talking about a different uh, interaction here. But I, I just, uh, like it as a motivating question, why did they stand beside each other when they could grow alone? Why this particular pair? And in thinking about that, um, it's about time in my talk to say what we consider the classic definition of a lichen, which is a symbiotic association between a filamentous fungus and a photobiont. And a photobiont is a photosynthetic symbiont. Typically these are green algae, but they can also be cyanobacteria. And of course, in some cases it's both. The filamentous fungi are generally ascomycetes, but there are some lichenized basidiomycetes as well. So here is our maritime sunburst lichens, Anthoria parientina. It is again a folio species, so we would have that same sort of structuring in the cross section if we were to um, slice through it. And so the idea with this was, okay, we define lichens as these two partners, so let's pull them apart in the lab and put them back together and see what happens. And you would think, well, have, <clears throat> have people done this before? And yes and no. <laughs> I stand on the shoulders of giants when it comes to the many people who have put in long hours of work to culture the components of lichens in the lab and tremendous work has been done in this area by many different people and actually is ongoing in many different labs around the world. But it's challenging. Lichens, particularly the mycobiont pictured here, grow very slowly in the lab. This petri plate, which is a nine centimeter classic petri dish size, represents a year of growth of that mycobiont. Um, and for anyone who works with other kinds of fungi, you will, <laughs> you may appreciate how, how very, very tremendously slow this is. So um, challenging to say the least. 
Interestingly, when we isolate the photobionts, they grow just fine on their own in culture in the lab. This is not too surprising because in fact, for the most part, we understand that the photobionts in lichens can grow freely and quite happily on their own in nature, whereas the mycobionts have not been observed to do the same. The mycobionts are really only observed in the lichenized state in nature. So I ran some experiments uh, during my postdoc to try to, like I said, pull these lichens apart, specifically the two main partners, bring them back together and see what's happening. And here are just some images from preliminary trials of doing so. We can see that there's some potential interactions taking place. These are just some more images of various uh, ways of looking at this. But in none of these images do you see anything like the Xanthoria parientina that I showed you uh, a few slides ago. So there's definitely some components missing here. And again, you can see that clearly here. So we have um, slide, or, sorry, plates of the mycobiont, the photobiont, and the two together. And so we were looking at gene expression of these different components, both in isolation and together, as well as within the lichen thallus. And this has been done by other groups. Um, the citations are in the bottom corner with other species of lichen. And what's very interesting across their results and my own is we, of course, see some gene expression in uh, some metabolic processes uh, in terms of nutrient and sugar exchange. Uh, we see some some things about recognition uh, and signaling. But when we compare the gene expression that we see in say the co-culture where the microbiome and the photobiont are growing together versus the lichen thallus, there, there are many genes not being expressed. So again, whether we're looking at the phenotype or the gene expression, there's clearly something missing when we just put the microbiome and the photobiont together in the lab. And of course, a more, well, I would say more recently, but since 2016, um, the world has been abuzz with this idea that the lichen symbiosis is not as straightforward as we thought before. Um, there are in fact, potentially many other players, but at the very least, um, some Basidiomyces yeasts that seem to be living in the cortex of many lichens, specifically macro lichens like our folios uh, lichens that I've been talking about in this, uh, throughout this talk. And we are still determining exactly what roles they play. Um, and it could be uh, many different things. They could be involved in important ways in the symbiosis or in the forming of the lichenized phenotype. But you know, definitely watch this space and watch the work uh, coming out of other lichen labs as well. So I wanna end with this idea that we need to redefine lichens, specifically if we want to understand the lichenized phenotype and really understand the lichen symbiosis more generally. So to really get at what's going on in the symbiosis, I think we need to consider all of these things. Of course, all, consider all the things, but truly, as I demonstrated, it's not enough to just look at the two main partners in isolation. We need to consider in the study of symbiosis and I think lichens really make a good case study for other interkingdom interaction studies that we need to consider the genotype or rather genotypes, the whole holobiome and the environment when we are looking at what mechanisms are driving symbiosis and indeed what role symbiosis plays in ecology and evolution. And with that, I will thank you so much for your time and will happily take any questions here or you can follow up with me uh, in later parts of the conference or on Twitter at the Lichen Lady. Thank you.